Hello, I'm Brian Lyles and I'm from DigitalOcean. And today we're going to talk about a company built on open source solutions, open source software. So what do I mean by a company built on open source software? I'm only going to take about eight or nine minutes here. So really, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're just going to talk about data. And really, DigitalOcean, founded about four years ago here in New York, has uh, grown from nothing to what it is today, 400,000 customers, almost 30 million virtual machines launched. And the way that we've done that is we've done with open source. We start from the bottom layer of using software like KVM on our hypervisors. Uh, we use MySQL in our data, we use Hadoop. But really what I want to talk about today is open source that we leverage for data. So the first section I want to talk about is event processing. And as a company who launches lots of virtual machines for customers, you'll notice that, um, you've probably guessed that we have a lot of events. Generally, um, it's not as high as high frequency trading, but it's definitely pretty high. So I've drawn a little picture here to show what I'm talking about, and I'll describe it. So when we first started, we had a very simplistic event system. And to simplify it, it's definitely more complex than this, but to simplify it, we had a front end, we had a database, and we had a hypervisor. So for instance, if we wanted to boot a hypervisor, what we would do is we would actually insert an event that says create droplet, or create droplet, it would go into the database, and then some process would work on all the hypervisors, and they would query or pull the database to figure out what was come out. And then one uh, server would win, and it would boot the droplet. So this works, but the problem is, is there's a couple of issues with this. First of all, is uh, using database as a, as, a, as a queue. It's kind of a computer science anti-pattern. And the other things is that as we, ex as we insert database or items into the database, the table that all these events is just continues growing. Uh, it's some very, very large number right now. And what we've seen is that we're not going to test the end of MySQL scaling, but we don't want to get anywhere close to even touching that. So we've kind of changed around and we've um, embraced something that we like to call, or anyone calls, the message-driven architecture. And what we've done is we've built a system that will be based more on a Kafka bus. And so now the front end, instead of inserting an event directly into the database, it just publishes says, hey, at some point in time, I would like to create a droplet. And the good thing now is that whenever the hypervisor gets that event for actually scheduling it, it doesn't have to do any kind of election process. And we also don't limit ourselves to only creating droplets. We can insert that event and we can use that for metrics. Inserting an event for creating a droplet can be used for multiple tasks. And it does not matter. It can be one to many on the back end. Uh, another thing I want to talk about today is our CPU army. Of course, we're a cloud provider. We're in a whole bunch of countries. We have a whole bunch of, of hypervisors. And we have a whole bunch of CPU cores. So today I want to talk about two things that we use to manage a lot of these CPU cores for internal work. The first one is Apache Mesos. Uh, what Apache Mesos is, is just a scheduler of schedulers. It's a hard concept to understand, but really when we take Mesos, Mesos allows you to specify that I have, a, I have a piece of work that needs to be scheduled and it needs this much CPU, it could potentially need this much disk, and it can be this much memory. And inside of Mesos, what we're doing is we are using something, we're using Marathon, which is an easier to use job scheduler, and we're using Kronos from Airbnb for one-time jobs. And the kind of work that we're doing on this is we are processing log data, lots and lots of log data. We use it to uh, back end our data science platform for actually figuring out how people use our company. But also I want to talk about Kubernetes from Google. And what Google has made is they have basically encapsulated all the knowledge they've learned from building their internal clusters and they've made it all open source. And we do use Kubernetes for a few of our data managing things, but mostly we're using it for, uh, for managing applications that consume the data layer. So you can imagine when you're in a company that has tens of thousands of physical machines that there's a lot of logs. Um, I will satisfy any questions you have and say, yeah, we do have a lot of logs. Um, we have mandates internally to uh, be able to handle over a half a million log lines per second. And you say, that's a lot, it actually is a lot. So how do we do this? Well, I've created this simple image here 
and I know this has a lot of squares on it, but it is pretty simple. We, we really just have a simple concept for logs. Um, first thing is we throw all logs to open, we throw all logs to standard out. We don't have to worry about any fancy log handling, and we don't use a lot of Java internally, so we don't have to worry about things like log4j and things like that. We just throw all logs to standard out. Another thing we do for all logs is in our case is that we encourage all of our developers to actually have um, a structured log. So instead of just throwing a line of random log text, we actually annotate that log with the message, whether it's an error, what time it came out, who might have created it, what process, what's host. And then in each region, uh, we have a few regions throughout the world, what we do is we take all that log data and we aggregate it. And then once it's aggregated at the centralized place in the region, we send it to our central log handler and we ingest it. On both sides of that conversation is our syslog, so it's our syslog talking to our syslog. And the reason we do it that way is because our syslog has great ways for handling um, what happens if we get too much log data at a time. Well, we can back it off to memory. Well, what if memory fills up? Well, we can back it off the disk, and our syslog does a great job of that. So after we get the log into our central region, we actually rewrite the trap, we rewrite the log, and we insert it into Elasticsearch. And then, so what we try to do is we try to keep some amount of data on in our, in our hot path. So we want that data to be mostly in memory or at least at local disk at, at worst. And then after a certain time, so let's say um, from weeks to months, what we do is we take all the all this data that's in Elasticsearch and we put it off on to our cold storage, uh, which resides in HDFS. And the way that that's used is that our analytics service, we have a multitude of analytics services, all engineering teams, our marketing teams, our data teams actually can query this to solve whatever problems they have. So, like I said, we have a myriad of data sources. Um, we have MySQL databases for multiple projects. We have um, HDF. H, uh, we have data sitting in HDFS that can be queried with Apache Hive. So what we need to do is we need to find a piece of software that can actually query those. So what we're using these days is uh, Presto. And if you're in familiar with the world, you've, you've heard of products like Presto. There's um, from, so there's Presto from Apache. Uh, you might have heard from a product called Redshift. But what I like about Presto is that, uh, first of all, Whenever you can query data pretty much as it rests. You don't have to worry about too much of an ETL process. That's great. And then also that you can have data that sits in a MySQL database. You can have data that's queried from Hive. You can have data that sits in Cassandra, and we use that as well for time series data. And you can write a single SQL query, and it can actually hit all three databases at once, and then it can create a single answer and send that off. So this was just a short summary of how we are consuming big data projects and from open source at DigitalOcean. Uh, thanks, this is Brian Lyles, and that's it.